Trump and I are proud to be the most pro-worker Republican ticket in history. And I want to talk about why we're fighting for working people, why we're going to fight for unions and non-union alike. That person decided not to press charges, and so we're just going to, uh, we stand by the Army statement that this matter is closed. What I'm going to be rolling out next week is basically a tax credit for startups, for small businesses. We're starting now. Hi, I'm Scott McFarland, CBS News, Washington, and welcome to America Decides. Both Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump are campaigning in battleground states today. Trump is in Michigan and Wisconsin as scrutiny grows over his visit to Arlington National Cemetery Monday, where an incident between cemetery and Trump staffers occurred. Vice President Harris and her running mate, Tim Walls, are on day two of their bus tour in Georgia, which concludes with a campaign rally in Savannah. A new CBS News poll shows Harris and Trump neck and neck among likely voters in Georgia. And later tonight, voters will get to see Harris and Walls' first joint TV interview on CNN. Nancy Cordes joins us now from Savannah, where a short while ago, Nancy, Vice President Harris addressed the criticism around changes in her policy stances during that CNN interview. Before we ask you questions, let's take a listen to some of it. My value around what we need to do to secure our border. That value has not changed. I spent two terms as the Attorney General of California prosecuting transnational criminal organizations, violations of American laws regarding the passage, illegal passage of guns, drugs, and human beings across our border. My values have not changed. Nancy, what else have we learned about the interview or the reaction to those comments? Uh, well, Scott, good evening to you. Sorry about the noise here. We're waiting for Kamala Harris to take the stage. In the meantime, it's something of a dance party here. Um, but what we heard from that interview, and we've only gotten a few snippets, we're going to hear uh, the rest of the interview. It lasted about a half an hour a little bit later tonight. Uh, she said that if she is elected, she will name at least one Republican uh, to her cabinet. She said that she has always welcomed diversity of opinions and that as president, she would be no different. She wants to have a range of voices at the table. And when it comes to her policy shifts, Scott, this was a really important avenue of inquiry because she did run in, 19, in 2019, 2020 for president a bit to the left of where she is now, particularly on issues like fracking, Medicare for all. And so she was pressed today by CNN's Dana Bash about why her positions have changed, what voters should make of it. And she said her values haven't changed and that she was able to accomplish some of what she was aiming for in her original policy positions with President Biden over the past four years. All right, with the soundtrack playing behind you, let me come back at you again, Nancy. What is the strategy we've heard so far about the vice president's campaign efforts in Georgia. What's the Georgia strategy that we're gleaning from this trip? Well, this was a two-day bus trip through southeastern Georgia, Scott, that involved a lot of retail politics, um, visiting shops, schools, uh, restaurants, just pressing the flesh, uh, the vice president and, uh, and her new running mate, um, just, you know, getting out of the bus and talking to folks. They are hoping that if they can run up the score here in southeastern Georgia, do a little bit better than Democrats typically do here, uh, that they have a shot of winning the state just like President Biden did four years ago. It was not looking that good for the Democratic ticket just one month ago, Scott. President Biden was trailing in our battleground tracker by four or five points. But now, Vice President Harris has pulled even with President Trump, and there are some new national polls out today showing big swings in support among young voters, among Hispanic voters nationwide, from Trump to Harris. So some really significant changes since President Biden dropped out of this race about 40 days ago. What do we know about the debate rules debate? Where does that stand ahead of September 10th? Well, uh, my understanding is that the campaigns are still in discussions with ABC. Uh, the Harris campaign is now pushing for a change in the rules so that uh, microphones would not be muted at any point. So if, for example, former President Trump tries to talk over Harris when it's her turn to speak, uh, you'd be able to hear all of that. Um, so far, we haven't been told that there's been officially a change made to the rules, even though former President Trump said 
he's up for it. Uh, his campaign doesn't like that Harris is trying to change the rules from what they had agreed to originally. And so uh, all of that is still being hashed out, even as former President Trump Scott continues to signal that maybe he won't participate at all. It kind of keeps going back and forth on that. Uh, although the signal that we're getting from his campaign is that it's still going to happen. As the campaign, the vice president's campaign, talked at all about this controversy of Donald Trump in Arlington National Cemetery? They are speaking about it very little, and Harris herself hasn't talked about it at all. We'll have to wait to see if she was asked about it in this CNN interview when the rest of it airs later tonight. Uh, there was a campaign spokesperson yesterday, Scott, who said that it was a sad situation. He said it wasn't surprising for the Trump campaign to get caught up in something like this. But I think that the Harris campaign believes that there are enough people out there from Gold Star families to current and former members of the military speaking out against what happened at Arlington National Cemetery and what the Trump campaign staffers may or may not have done pushing a staffer at the cemetery aside that the Harris campaign doesn't feel like it needs to really weigh into this very much at all. Well, besides the epic spotlights behind you and the percussion, get, paint a picture of what you're seeing at that rally in Savannah right now. Well, it's it's filled to the brim. Uh, people started showing up hours ago. Uh, they're not used to seeing a Democratic presidential candidate, or really any presidential candidate here in Savannah, this close to Election Day. Uh, typically, a lot of the electoral love ends up going to Atlanta uh, on the other side of the state. So um, people here are pretty fired up. There are people of all ages, all races, a lot of college students who are here as well. Um, and, you know, ready to welcome the vice president with open arms in just a few minutes, Scott. Masterful work fighting through the noise and the percussion behind you. Nancy Cordes in Savannah, thank you very much. As Nancy reported, the Army says an Arlington National Cemetery official was, quote, abruptly pushed aside during a dispute with the Trump campaign over political activity there Monday. The employee has decided not to press charges. There are nearly... I think it's like 3,000 public ceremonies that are conducted at Arlington National Cemetery um, every single year without incident. Um, the rules and regulations are very, very clear. What happened uh, earlier this week is very unfortunate. Let's go to the Pentagon. Ellie Watson joins us there now. Ellie, this is quite something that the U.S. Army has issued a statement about all this, a public statement. We know the Trump campaign has denied there was a physical altercation. What else is the Army saying about what happened here? Hi, Scott. Yeah, the Army has now directly uh, contradicted what the Trump campaign's account of what happened on Monday was. According to the Army statement released today, a female staffer was, quote, abruptly pushed aside, as you said, by members of the Trump campaign's staff. That directly contradicts the Trump campaign's account that there was no physical altercation. According to the Army, this staffer has been unfairly attacked for trying to enforce the rules she laid out to the Trump campaign ahead of time. Uh, some of those attacks have come not only from Trump supporters, but also from the Trump campaign itself, whose chief communications director uh, claimed that the staffer was, quote, clearly suffering from a mental health episode. The Trump campaign has said that they have video to back up their account, but so far has not released it. The Army, which has issued this statement, rare statement, wading into political controversy, is now defending uh, that cemetery official. Walk us through the rules around this Section 60 part of Arlington National Cemetery. Well, photography at Arlington Cemetery as a whole is allowed with permission, but federal law prohibits any filming or photography related to campaigning or partisan activity. And officials are pretty strict about enforcing that, especially at Section 60. And that's for good reason. Section 60, where this altercation allegedly occurred, is considered and feels like sacred ground. It is where veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan are buried and are still visited by their parents, their brothers, their sisters, their uh, spouses and kids. It's a place where those families can go to be with their loved ones and where the rest of us can go and honor the sacrifices they made. Some families of victims who were killed in the Abbey Gate bombing that killed 13 U.S. service members during the withdrawal from Afghanistan did invite former President 
Trump to visit. And for sure, it could be an honor to have a former president visit. But the issue is that there are other families whose loved ones are buried there who may grieve differently. And that's why the cemetery has such strict rules in place about filming. And we know the incident was reported in some way to the military police there. Could there be any consequences for the Trump campaign officials? Yeah, the Army statement said that the staffer did file a report with military police, but has decided not to press charges. The Army considers the matter closed, so that leaves it up to the court of public opinion to decide uh, the consequences for this incident, alleged incident. And as we know, these days, the court of public opinion rarely agrees on anything. At the Pentagon for us, L.D. Watson, thank you. Israel's military is continuing its raid in the occupied West Bank. Coming up, how the move could impact ceasefire and hostage release negotiations in Gaza. You're streaming America Decides. Take a look at Savannah, Georgia. Vice President Kamala Harris has taken the podium for a rally there that my colleague Nancy Cordes says is in an arena that is filled to the brim, a capacity crowd in Savannah, Georgia, just area Democratic candidates don't go too often, but this seems to be either a strategic pivot by this ticket to go to areas that aren't as reliably blue or an area that this ticket thinks can become much more blue with the campaign stop and more campaign attention. Kamala Harris speaking before a rally in Savannah, Georgia. Meanwhile, we go north now. Donald Trump holding a town hall in La Crosse, Wisconsin. It's moderated by former Democratic Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, who endorsed former President Trump earlier this week. That's where we find CBS Minnesota reporter and anchor Esme Murphy, who's there. Esme, walk us through what we should expect in La Crosse tonight. Well, Scott, I know you've been to many, many Trump rallies. This is not a rally. It's a town hall, although... As town halls go, this is a pretty big one. I'm just going to step out of the shot here. You can see there's seating for thousands out in front, and then there on the stage will be the people asking the questions. The two center chairs there, those are for Tulsi Gabbard and the former president. We've asked the Trump campaign exactly how were the questioners chosen. We have not gotten an answer back. But the setup is a town hall format. The goal we're being told by some Trump insiders is to have the president, the former president, say more on message. They believe by having questions that he will know in advance and be able to answer those questions, he will stay on message and avoid some of those personal attacks that's get, been getting criticism, not just from Democrats, but also from some Republicans. In this one-time Democratic Congresswoman, Tulsi Gabbard, part of this event, what sway might she have with voters in a state like Wisconsin or your home state of Minnesota? Well, you know something, Scott, to be honest with you, I cannot imagine what kind of sway. Um, she's a former Democratic congresswoman from Hawaii, as you know. She changed to be an independent. She has endorsed Donald Trump. She has zero sway. I mean, people might remember her name, but I, I doubt if you went up and asked 10 people who Tulsi Gabbard was at this hall, I, I don't think you'd have nine wouldn't know who she was. So it's really not clear, you know, except that he does want some kind of a moderator and she was the one who got the call. But, uh, Scott, to be honest, I would say no sway at all. Well, let's talk about the real sway. Governor Walls in Minnesota, Governor Walls in Wisconsin. How has that selection energized the Democratic voters you cover in Minnesota, where there is, oh, by the way, a very competitive congressional race? Yeah, I think it's energized voters both in Minnesota and Wisconsin. People seem to relate to Tim Walls, and the polls show that. He is up in the polls compared to J.D. Vance, who has negative ratings in some of the polls. I think what Tim Walls brings to this ticket is a level of Midwestern authenticity. He is from a small town. He did take the GI Bill to go through college because his family didn't have enough money to pay for college. He can talk the small town talk. No one's going to out small town Kim Walls. Also, he was a teacher. He served in the military. All of this brings a lot of credibility. And perhaps the most important thing when it comes to small town credibility, he was a football coach, as the campaign is stressing many, many times over and over again. 
there really is nothing bigger in small towns across America than the high school football coach, and that's Tim Walls. So I think he has energized the ticket with voters on both sides of the Mississippi River, both in Minnesota and here in Wisconsin. At the town hall in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Esme Murphy, we thank you. Now to the Middle East, Israel is pressing ahead with its operation in the West Bank. Their military claims to have killed five more militants in the occupied region. We go now to Imtiaz Tayab, who's on the ground there for us. Imtiaz. Well, as you can see, this building is nearly totally destroyed following the massive Israeli raid in this refugee camp in the occupied West Bank. And we've been speaking to local residents who tell us that the Israelis believe that this building was being used to store weapons, something they say couldn't be further from the truth. Whatever the case, the situation has calmed now. The Israeli forces have withdrawn from here, but that is very different from what we're seeing elsewhere across the occupied West Bank, where in places like Jilin, in places like Tolkarim, uh, Israeli forces in their hundreds are still there, sometimes in, frankly, pitched battles with armed groups in these areas. Now, Israel says that it is carrying out what it's calling a counter-terrorism operation, whereas locals here say that they are deliberately targeting Palestinian refugee camps as a way to essentially empty them out. Whatever the case, the situation remains incredibly tense and incredibly volatile. Empty as tie up. Thank you very much. Democrats say new rules in Georgia could block or delay the November election results. Concerns over the changes some are calling Trump friendly. You're streaming America Decides. Georgia Democrats are suing the state election board there over new rules they claim could be used by county officials to block the certification of an election. The state and national Democratic parties allege these rules could create post-election chaos and that the board is exceeding its legal authority by adopting them. But pro-Trump Republicans say the rules reinforce a county election board's existing duty to thoroughly examine election results. David Becker is with us here now, CBS News election law contributor and executive director of the Center for Election Innovation and Research. As best as we can, let's try to explain these rules. David, you take first crack at it. Sure. Well, first we have to understand what certification is. It's just the non-discretionary ministerial act of giving legal effect to an election. So the best analogy I can come up with is it's kind of like a professional golfer at the end of the round. He has to sign his golf cart and say, this is, this is what my round is. That's what gives his round effect, but it's not an opportunity for him to say, actually, I got a birdie on hole 13. Can you give that birdie to me now? There's another path for that. In elections, if you have a reason to believe that there was a problem, there is a legal challenge process. <clears throat> so you, you go to court for right. and you bring it through the judicial system. You bring evidence, you subject it to scrutiny and cross-examination, a court hears it, and over t time, as that's presented, the court will rule one way or another, but it requires evidence. It is not a time for political appointees, as, as here in Georgia, for political appointees to consider whether or not they like the results. It is not the duty of members of the Georgia State Board of Elections to do an analysis of whether the election was run well. It is their duty under Georgia law to certify the election. And under Georgia law, what then occurs is if someone wants to challenge an election, that certification happens first. And then they go to court and say, I don't actually like what happened in this election and I have evidence to prove it. Now, what the Democrats say in their lawsuit challenging this is that it invites chaos into the system. Let's assume for a moment one county challenges something before certification. How does one <clears throat> county challenging one thing invite chaos that's worth anything? Well, think of the state as a puzzle, and Georgia is a puzzle with 159 counties, 159 pieces. And if one of those counties refuses to certify, it's impossible for the state as a whole to certify the entire statewide election results. And the state is required by law to do that, as are the counties prior to that. So if a county decided to hold up certification for whatever reason, and we've seen this in some other states, it could prevent the state from meeting its deadlines both under the state law and federal law, because for the presidency, they need to certify and what's called ascertain their electors before December 11th. That's when the ascertainment has to be reported to Washington, D.C., and then the electors have to meet on December 17th. So it clock's could be... ticking. Yeah, the clock's ticking, and that clock cannot be stopped. The Supreme Court has made that clear. So it might be the intent of the losing candidate to try to slow down or stop that in order to muck up the works and prevent it. 
I'll also say, though, I have a lot of confidence that that won't happen. In Georgia and elsewhere, there are um, people who take their responsibilities very seriously. Governor Kemp has said that he will certify the results accurately. Secretary Raffensperger has already shown that they, they both have already shown that they will follow the law and respect the will of Georgia's voters. So they have this lawsuit filed with the support of the vice president's <clears throat> campaign. How do you see a lawsuit of this sort of playing out? This all feels like we're in uncharted territories and this all feels very novel. Yeah, right now it is kind of novel. We've never really seen an attack on the mechanics of election certification like this before. We saw it a little bit in 2020. We were wondering whether or not, for instance, the Michigan State Board of Canvassers was going to certify. They did. One of the, one of the two Republican members certified it, creating a majority. We've seen at the county level in states like New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Michigan, and elsewhere, where there have been county efforts to deny certification in other elections, but we've never seen this on this kind of scale where it's been attacked statewide and in multiple states in advance of a presidential election. This is going to be a matter of state law. I think Georgia state law is very clear, as is every state's law. Certification is just a non-discretionary ministerial act. Those who are appointed to certify have a duty under their oaths to certify. So the Georgia courts will rule on that and we'll see what happens. The interesting here, thing here is this Republican-dominated board of Trump allies. This is a fairly recent development in Georgia. This is uh, prior to around May or June. The state board is actually getting along quite well with both Republicans and Democrats. There are some recent appointees that have changed that. And what they may be doing is opening up the door, ironically, to Democratic board members challenging a result if Trump happens to win in Georgia. And remember, there are Democratic yeah. members of the board in every county and on the state board. So they They've opened up a potential Pandora's box here. We noted also that three of those board members who voted this rule change into place were shouted out by former President Trump at a rally in Atlanta. So let's put Georgia aside for a moment. Are there other states where certification is either at risk uh, or somebody's trying to make a move on getting more into certification than there should be? I don't know of any other states where this is being done at the state level like it is in Georgia, but I, we are seeing this at the county level in a whole bunch of states. And I should say, when you've got political appointees who have a sworn legal duty to perform a, an important ministerial role in an election like certification, I have never heard in any state of those kinds of appointees even attending a political rally like that rally, let alone allowing themselves to be called out and supported by name. It really calls into question what's happening here, whether there's some something unusual going on in Georgia. Prior to this new alignment on the Georgia State Board of Elections, just as recently as May and April, this kind of effort was proposed and it was rejected. Four of the members rejected it and one abstained. So there wasn't even a single member who supported it. It was only upon a change in personnel, the same personnel who were called out at this rally, that we saw this rule change come about that might potentially erode the guardrails around democracy. Certainly not the last we've heard of it. It's going to be a drumbeat we hear about between now and November 5th. CBS News election law expert David Becker, as always, thank you. Thank you, Scott. In the same week, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton launched a series of raids tied to allegations of voter fraud. The state's governor is promoting a massive purge of the Texas voter roll. The state has removed roughly a million people from its voter rolls since 2021. Among those removed were more than 463,000 people who were on the state's suspense list. That list tracks those voters who don't update their information and don't vote for two election cycles. Although voter roll maintenance is common, critics are calling into question the timing of the latest purge. Weeks before an election, all this is doing is intimidating and dissuading Texans from voting. According to state figures, there are 17 million registered voters in Texas. More than 2 million of those are on the suspense list and at risk of losing their vote. QAnon phrases, calls to imprison political opponents, and sexist and misogynistic statements. Former President Donald Trump shares a barrage of social media posts. Our political panel weighs in next. You're streaming America Decides. Donald Trump has not shied away from outbursts on his social media platform, Truth Social. And on Wednesday, he shared a barrage of posts, several of them deleted, that called for his political opponents to be jailed. Among the dozens of posts the former president reposted was this doctored image that depicts several of his political adversaries in orange jail jumpsuits. 
former president also shared a misogynistic post surrounding Vice President Kamala Harris and Hillary Clinton. That post suggested Harris traded sexual favors to boost her political career. And bring in our political panel now, Shelby Talcott and Finn Gomez. Shelby's political reporter for Semaphore. Finn is our political director here at CBS News. All right, Finn, let's start off with what do you make of these social media posts? He knows people are going to see them. He knows people are going to read them. We're 68 days from Election Day. What do you make of it? You know, I think that barrage that you saw, I mean, it was clearly uh, the Trump of old. The Trump where you, you know, you, we've heard a lot about the cycle of a disciplined Trump, of a Trump that, 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 that is focusing on message. And I think since, since Vice President Harris moved to the top of the ticket, now a little over a month ago, you've seen him go off message. You see him go off the rails here. And that's, this is what, what happened in, in, over these posts over the last 24 hours. I, I think it's, I think politically it's, it's a misfire. It causes more attention to where the heat, the, like the campaign does not want to go. Uh, and I think it could cause we have seen a, a we have seen a divide among amongst women voters, men voters in, in between the two camps. Uh, there's a pretty significant uh, uh, gulf between um, supporters of of the Trump campaign and Harris campaign. More women are supporting uh, uh, Vice President Harris, and that can only grow with these these kind of these kind of social media posts. It's the, camp message. the campaign seemed undisciplined Monday, Shelby, with this incident at Arlington National Cemetery. Tell us what you have on that, or what you think about the latest developments on that. Yeah, so when I talk to Donald Trump's campaign, they clearly want to put this behind them. When I've talked to his advisors, they say this is about him going there, him honoring these people that were killed during the Afghanistan withdrawal. Where was Joe Biden? That's where the focus should be. And I know Finn has spoken to some of the family members um, and so has more on that. But that's how Donald Trump's team is kind of is, is focusing on this. And it is that they're not really right. They're saying this isn't this isn't an issue. This didn't have to do with Donald Trump himself. Um, we should stay focused on on what's actually going on. Yeah, my Trump sources have been telling me the same thing that you know that the, there's been a lack of focus on the the, the whole point of being there. Uh, you know, the disastrous pull out of Afghanistan, the 13 uh, d dead service members, the 100 uh, dead Af Afghans that happened. But at the same time, you know, the the fact of the matter is there are you know, and they have said, of course, that they were invited by the uh, one of the members of the family to the this hollowed site. But it's very clear there's a policy that says that this is not this type of activity is not allowed on site. Um, I did I did speak to a Gold Star family just a, a little while ago, uh, and they have been very critical of Donald Trump's visit to um, Arlington National Cemetery. Their son's buried there. They think this kind of activity should not occur there. Any sort of political activity and any sort of that sort of uh, tension uh, uh, really takes away and lessens uh, the 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 significance and the the. the the, 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 again, the hollowed space that is the Arlington National Cemetery. And, and I think, just to your point, at the end of the day, what, what happened on Monday, the incident that happened, we don't know the full details. True. It's sort of a he said, she said situation. But something clearly happened. Yeah. And it just is more broadly representative of how Donald Trump keeps having these incidents, whether it's him reposting things on social media or his campaign a team doing something at Arlington National Cemetery that are distracting, and it's a distraction from what his campaign advisors want him to focus on and want his campaign to focus on, which is the issues, immigration, the border, the economy, um, and all of these things are essentially distractions. You know what, no, what? You know what people are not talking about this week is immigration, inflation, the economy. Exactly. They're, they're talking about all these other events that have occurred. It's the time of the election cycle where we also focus in closely on any poll. Any substantive Oof. name brand poll that comes Scott, along. You know I love polls. So. <laughs> Fox News' this poll is something that caught people's attention on Wednesday. It had quite a divide between the head-to-head -head battles between Vice President Harris and former President Trump in those Sun Belt states, North Carolina, Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia. And the Senate candidates on the Republican side trailing significantly. Big delta between Trump and the Republican Senate candidates. Shelby, let me start with you. What do you make of that? I would think that there's a few things here. You know, you see, for example, how Kerry Lake is polling compared to Donald Trump. And it sort of shows that some of Donald Trump's, and we've seen this in, in the midterms in years past, Donald Trump doesn't always pick the best people. But it also shows that there's a real divide with the American public over how they feel about Donald Trump and Kamala Harris and how they feel about some of these other presidential candidates. It's really unique, right? You have candidates who, for example, 
plan to vote for Donald Trump, but really don't like Carrie Lake, which is interesting because politically, they're pretty similar. They get along really well in private. They're good friends. They carry themselves similarly. Exactly. Um, and so it's, I don't know quite why, considering, as you said, they are so similar, but there is a divide between the top of the ticket and the down ballot candidates. And Finn, it's not just Arizona. It may be most profound in Arizona, but we do see this in some of the other races, including the North Carolina governor mm -hmm. race mm -hmm. and the Nevada Senate race. Right, and, and, and like North Carolina is growing in its significance, and that's something that we all should be emphasizing because it is. It is. It is a critical battleground state that even if, like, potentially, if Harris loses that state, and if you look at the, the map of 270, if she loses that state, she could still win if she wins North Carolina. Uh, both both campaigns know this. It's so significant. And what's happening there with Mark Robinson, one of the most controversial candidates of this cycle, who's running for governor, the lieutenant governor there, is he's having a down ballot effect. He's he's pulling. Uh, Donald Trump down, if you will, if you if you look at those that data from that Fox poll that came out, uh, and it, it is having an impact, uh, and it could have an impact in that in that presidential race as well. I look, I, I do love Arizona. I think that is uh, that race. I think it's, it's it is a huge race. I'm really into it. Uh, you know, and what Gallego is is doing, and what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what his camp, he 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 told me himself that one of his his focus and his um, the way he's addressing immigration, I think is is. They believe, Democrats in his campaign believe that it is a successful uh, recipe potentially for Democrats to, to, to win on that issue. To be the aggressor. To be the aggressor, but also having a more, more, of, a, more of a sort of a, a moderate, if you will, centrist perspective on, on the border. Right. Not, you know, he comes from he, he, he is a progressive in a lot of ways on certain policies. But to have a more centrist perspective on the border is 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 effective. He's a, he's a former he's a veteran. Uh, he, he he's 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 Latino with the 30 percent of the population in that state is, is Hispanic. So I think there's there's multiple um, components there. But on immigration, probably the top top two like uh, uh, issues of this cycle, uh, he could have a winning formula that could be more expansive, so, similar to what you covered yourself in, in the New York third uh, special election, right, where Swazi came out and, and won on that issue as well, found a way to for for Democrats to to really come out of the out of the forest there. Shelby, you have a piece of reporting about Virginia's governor, Glenn Youngkin, making the argument Virginia could be one of those battleground states. When he won the governorship in 2021, I suppose it sure was. What did you find out? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm skeptical, to, to say the least, right now. But this is the, the, the period of the campaign cycle where you hear things like that. We have seen a few polls recently that shows uh, Donald Trump trailing Kamala Harris just by three points in Virginia, which is notable, of course. Um, and a lot of people in Virginia politics believe that that is because of Glenn Youngkin. He has really high favorability ratings. He is well-liked. He has done a lot in the states. And they believe that with his help and if he campaigns more aggressively for Donald Trump, then theoretically, Donald Trump could win Virginia. Again, I am skeptical, and this is this reminds me of you know when I hear Democrats say that Florida is in play for them. I think at the end of the day, it's a lot of talk, and you have to follow the money, right? And Donald Trump has not spent money in Virginia, and just as exactly, and just as Kamala Harris has not really spent any significant amount of money in uh, in Florida, besides to troll him in the this Mar-a-Lago right, area right, right. earlier this I week. Saw that, yeah. So until they both start investing in these sorts of states, it it is sort of just talk. Virginia is purple. It's a purple state, but it's got a bluish tint. I mean, I, it, it would be it's an uphill it's an uphill battle to to turn that state red. I mean, it may, and maybe Young can say something that others are not, but it is sort of blue there, Scott. Or maybe he's saying that because he wants the opportunity to interview with Shelby Talcott <laughs> and Finn Gomez. Thank you both. Thanks, Scott. It calls itself the country's most pro-life state. So why do so many pregnant mothers keep dying there? We speak to a reporter who's been covering Arkansas's preventable pregnancy deaths. You're streaming America Decides. An alarming number of women are dying from pregnancy-related complications in a state that bills itself as, quote, the most pro-life in the country. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, 38.3 percent of female deaths in Arkansas are caused or aggravated by pregnancy or its management. That's more than 15 percent points higher than the national rate. 
A state review committee report published late last year concluded roughly 92 percent of pregnancy-related deaths in Arkansas between 2018 and 2020 were preventable. Andy Gowan joins me now, national correspondent for The Washington Post, who did some exceptional reporting here. She wrote an in-depth article for The Post examining all this and more. And Annie, thanks for making time for us. For your article, you spoke to all kinds of people, mothers, doulas, doctors, one obstetrician who said to you, quote, I can't remember the last time I had a patient come in healthy, young, with no medical problems and have a baby and go home. What was it like to hear that yeah. and learn about these challenges? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I, I've been at the post for a long, a long time, and this was actually one of the most complicated situations that I've ever like looked into, just because there's so many moving parts. But Dr. Worley, that you mentioned there, you know, I think she put the she she really uh, got to the heart of the issue, which is that one of the biggest problems about trying to address this is that there are a lot of uh, most of the patients that live in this you know poor, health, unhealthy state have a, a lot of underlying conditions, which can really complicate things. You know, they they have diabetes, they have have uh, heart conditions, they have kidney conditions, they come in very overweight, um, you know, 300, 400, and 500 pounds, and these doctors are trying to uh, manage the pregnancy. So even before you start trying to address these issues, you have the the underlying health, um, you know, health concerns that she says that, you know, addressing those things can take years. Help draw a line between the overturning of Roe versus Wade and this issue. Um, it seems intuitive that there's a connection, but help us, through your reporting, figure out how you got from point A to point B. Well, so, you know, that's what we're doing. We're looking at these red states where they had abortion bans, and in many of those states, um, you know, the, the, they happen to be some of the states that have the worst outcomes um, for moms and babies in terms of health care. Um, in, in Arkansas, you know, they they are the governor who's Sarah Huckabee Sanders that we all know because she was a Trump uh, spokesman. And um, she's she's actually just formed a panel to try and address this. But but these these you know, these problems are persistent. And it's you know, she even will admit that they they're coming into this, you know, quite late. But in the last two years, you know, they have done some things. They've given money to pregnancy crisis centers almost, you know, now that it's just almost two million dollars this year. Um, but many of those are faith based. And, you know, a lot of people feel that, you know, that, that the money should be more evenly distributed um, um, amongst uh, groups like, for example, the doula that I focused on, who was not a religious themed organization. So um, the other problem is that doctors, you know, they're the. The, the place where I was working was called Warren, Arkansas, and the doula there, uh, they lost their birthing ward um, in the hospital because they couldn't afford to keep it open. And so a lot of it was due to staff. So doctors are afraid to come. It's hard to recruit um, to the, you know, to these states with abortion bans because, you know, they, you know, the oversight is so strict and they're afraid of making a mistake in these new conditions. So um, that's another challenge is recruiting uh, OBGYNs to these rural areas where it was hard in the first place, you know, because it's always hard to get uh, rural doctors doctors into these or doctors into these rural areas. So um, that's also been a huge challenge for the state. In your reporting, you mentioned this remarkably high teen birth rates, double the national rate. Do you get a sense of what's driving that? Uh, well, you know, uh, birth rates, uh, teen rate birth rates are coming down, but in Arkansas, the, they're not coming down anywhere near fast as, as the national rate. I mean, it's still double the national average. And in Arkansas, they use the the kids uh, have unprotected sex about seventy five percent more than the national average. Um, one of the things that um, there's a couple things that they're that the advocates say that they're not doing, and one of them is. Uh, pre, you know, at, uh, sex education in the schools. They they really don't have programs. It's not required. And if, if they do teach it, they must teach about abstinence only. Um, you know, so that's an issue. And the state also just recently or in recent years has made it more difficult for kids to get access uh, to contraceptions contraceptives through schools. So there's been a number of, of things that they have, um, you know, put in place that, you know, that really exacerbates the problem. And um, you know, the advocates say that that's really one thing that they really need to start working on because, of course, the teen moms also also can be at risk for uh, for issues like ectopic pregnancies and um, preeclampsia, which are severe, um, you know, severe complications when you're pregnant. Annie Gowan, some very strong reporting for The Washington Post. Thanks for making time for us. Thank you. 
The Democrats' road to winning back the U.S. House may not run through the much-talked-about battleground states that are so defining the presidential race. Why the race for Congress involves New York and California, and why they may be the ones to watch. You're streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. The Democratic Party's path to taking the House could run through states beyond what we consider battlegrounds in the presidential election. Keeping a close eye on contests in New York and California, Democrats lost several seats in the Empire State in 2022, which is part of why they lost the lower chamber. Republicans are aiming to hold on to their slim four-seat majority, and those states have, if nothing else, an awful lot of seats. Hunter Woodall is seated next to me here. You've been doing your reporting on New York and California House races. I mean, they don't just have a lot of seats. They have a lot of competitive seats, and that's the bottom line. Which ones are you watching most closely? Well, as you mentioned, I mean, New York, there's at least four, you know, seats that really could be important in this election. And there's one in particular that you know, shows where we're at. That's a seat of Republican Representative Mike Lawler. He's a freshman Republican. He's somebody that's gotten a positive shout out from President Joe Biden, uh, you know, early in his term, yeah. but also gets on Twitter and praises, you know, the late Senator John McCain. That's not something we see much from Republicans these days and kind of speaks to the center right tilt that he's trying to make in this race. Doesn't seem like there were any surprises. If we begin in New York and look at California as well, doesn't feel like there were any surprises in the primaries where either party ended up nominating somebody less electable, which was a dynamic that hurt Republicans in 2022. Absolutely. And that's a noticeable thing here. I mean, and, you know, Donald Trump doesn't like Republicans who voted to impeach him after January 6th. But you do have a Republican representative, David Valdeo, in California running for re-election. He's one of the last two House Republicans who voted to impeach Trump after January 6th. Republicans' House majority may depend on Valdeo winning that seat, which is something that's an interesting dynamic for Trump Republicans. You have all those very distant suburbs of the big cities like Los Angeles that are in play. So what are the issues that are there? Are they any different than the, the very blue or the very red seats? Well, that's the thing. You know, at the end of the day, these are still the issues we're going to see constantly in battleground districts this election season. It's going to be the economy. It's going to be about abortion rights. But it's also going to be about immigration. And these are topics, you know, Republicans have a lot of messaging tactics that worked in 2022. They can use this again, even though it's, you know, Vice President Harris at the top of the ticket rather than President Biden. That could be a vulnerability for Democrats. But you also have Republicans who can who have that struggle of, hey, we had the House majority for the last few years. We had a lot of struggle with getting things done. So you have this enormous change at the top of the ticket, which both sides are talking about. Do you have a sense of how this impacts those areas that were competitive to begin with, where they're unpredictable to begin with? Any idea from your reporting what happens next there? Well, 2022, you know, was a year where Republicans thought they were going to have a red wave. And obviously they didn't have that as much, but they did retake control of the House. The problem is now it's a presidential race. They're, they don't have the ballot to themselves. They are going to have this large presidential race at the top of the ticket in blue states like New York and California. That's going to matter a lot. And I think you're going to see a struggle from Republicans. Do they continue to embrace Donald Trump or do they try and track to this dwindling center right of the political sphere that doesn't appear to be having much traction these days? Yeah, there's, there's just so many competitive seats in those two states. It's hard to overlook them. And when we get more time down the road, we could talk about the home areas of the vice presidential nominees. There's a competitive race in Minnesota and in Ohio. Hunter Woodall, thank you very much. And that does it for today. We're back with another edition of America Decides Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern. The Daily Report with John Dickerson starts right now.